is honored for me, first of all, represents adding a new fictional place on the map of important non-existing cities. I draw and I paint and I was an industrial designer, so technically I was formed to reproduce things that don't exist in a very realistic way. And my tools are mainly um, light, architecture and composition, so science fiction cities are my specialty. Industrial designers are again formed and trained to create things that don't exist and to make them appealing. And industrial design in itself is fiction. I specialized in advanced prototypes for, for non-existing cars, which, uh, which are absolutely dream objects. And that, that's why the training is very useful. And historically, people like Sid Mead, who's designed Blade Runner, was an industrial designer, and he had the attention to detail and to craftsmanship to, to make up a whole world and make it very believable. So it, it's, it's a very obvious relationship between science fiction and industrial design. So in Dishonored, you play a supernatural assassin in a steampunk city, a city called Dunwall. And the game has a, what I would describe as a non-photorealistic art style. Uh, led by Sebastian Maton and uh, Viktor Antonov. When we first started the project, Raf and I kept saying, this is London, 1666. It was the last year of the plague and the year of the Great Fire. The city of London at that point is pivotal to the world and pivotal to history. The early creative influences were historical architectural pictures of London and maps of London start with a, with a location. Where is this taking place? All kinds of representations from different artists, painters, photographers, and filmmakers. As a visual designer, Victor works kind of like a historian. He really proceeds with uh, what-ifs scenarios. So, okay, what if instead there was this uh, event happening in history? We looked at specific rooftops, specific smokestacks, and facade ornaments that were very specific only to London and to no other city. When the first uh, design come back is that it looks very real, even though it's, it's not, but it, it's kind of believable because our brain kind of processes it in a way which it just looks like, oh wow, that looks like a place that could exist. And that's why I think uh, his methodology is so powerful to people. We have studied, in fact, the fog, the night, the rain, the the skies that are very high, in fact, and that weigh on the experience of the player. It was really an approach that we had to not do a game where it's very beautiful, it's the sun, it's how it filters the light. So that's all we have studied in London. And then, to transfer it into the game, it had to be a little bit of development technique to try to De, de, de modifier la façon dont réagit la lumière avec les éléments du jeu vidéo, c'est-à-dire dans le brouillard, si on peut faire des haze et, des, et, des, euh, et faire bloomer euh, nos lights. C'est un bon setup pour un jeu vidéo. Et euh, euh, c'est une ville qui comporte une rivière, donc c'était très important pour nous, pour les, les missions qu'on fait dans notre jeu. En fait, on n'a pas l'approche classique du jeu vidéo. On, on a vraiment voulu revenir à des bases classiques d'art pur, c'est-à-dire euh, les références qu'on qu a. Euh, elles n'ont rien à voir avec... Euh, on ne fait pas de recherche sur Google, on ne, on ne cherche pas à faire de choses génériques, on veut vraiment créer quelque chose d'unique. De, de, Mais le plus que nous avons travaillé sur le jeu, le plus que deux choses ont commencé à se passer. Quand Raph et moi et l'équipe ont collaboré avec Victor Antonov et uh, Sebastian Maton, we started moving the game forward and forward in time, you know, until we eventually got to some sort of 1800s. We also moved further and further away from the real world and eventually just said, okay, this is the city of Dunwall. We were somewhere in, in this time period where there's no a lot of technology, but there's a lot of mechanical technology going on. So we based everything on suspension, steam, and basic fuel. We wanted to bring some rock and roll into that and, and some um, uh, modern elements. So we started adding more science fiction elements, pulling it forward in time and including technologies from probably um, mid 19th century. So this was just one foundation, one layer. Up on this layer, we built what happened to the city 30 years later, 70 years later, etc. Technology and the machines and, and dishonored have a again a specific narrative function. They tell the story of the ruler of the country who has a flair for industrial design and progress. So he's building 
uh, bridges and buildings and fences and devices to modernize the city and to crush and oppress people as well. The whaling trade takes off and uh, there's a brilliant inventor called Sokolov who's for us a little bit Rasputin, a little bit Da Vinci, a little bit John Dee and he invents some devices and takes advantage of the volatile whale oil and, and then the oppressive government begins to use those devices against the people as a sort of security layer. The whale oil industry and dishonor is manifested in, and, and represented through visual elements and design elements uh, like ships and boats and uh, all that suggests that the world is bigger than the city and you have an ocean and you have four in different lands and, uh, and maybe colonies so you have these mysterious ships bringing these strange animals because they're not regular whales, they're Dunwall whales. So you see them th through harbors and rivers and through the coast and uh, the, the whale ships uh, expand the, the scope of the city. The characters and the character design in Dishonor are no different than the architectural design on the design of the light. We wanted to get into the identity of these characters. We looked into British morphology. How are the eyes set? How's the nose? How's the skin? Play with the grotesque and with the beautiful and we stylize this into um, a variety of very real faces that have a backstory and a meaning to them. On a travaillé with people a peu à travers toute l'Europe et euh, qui, qui étaient vraiment des spécialistes en fait de, de l'anatomie pour essayer de ne pas perdre euh, l'intention qu'on avait mis dans, le, dans, les, dans les visuels euh, au départ. Et euh, on a pris des gens qui étaient spécialisés par exemple dans les silhouettes et dans les vêtements, dans la découpe des plis, la façon dont travaille euh, un jean ou, euh, ou un pantalon. On ne voulait pas justement que ça ressemble à, à des personnages de jeux vidéo avec des jambes en tube et, euh, et quelques polygones pour donner de l'effet ou juste des shaders. C'est-à-dire qu'on vraiment travaille la silhouette, c'est-à-dire que nos personnages ont une approche de loin parce que c'est un jeu de combat donc on détecte, on détecte les personnages de loin et on a besoin aussi d'avoir un fort caractère quand ils sont très près. Ce qui rend vraiment euh, les personnages de Dishonored uniques, c'est euh, le fait qu'on a voulu les typer euh, dès le début en fait. On est parti dans cette, euh, dans cette stylisation et euh, par exemple euh, au niveau euh, des proportions, euh, si, euh, si je repense euh, au City Guard, en fait, qui est un combattant, on n'a pas hésité à lui, euh, lui grossir les mains, euh, à réduire sa, sa boîte crânienne euh, pour vraiment qu'il ait le, le physique qui, qui reflète euh, ce qu'il fait dans le jeu. Et à l'opposé, euh, on a par exemple les aristocrates qui sont beaucoup plus élancés, euh, avec des fronts plus hauts, qui, qui sont assez hautains, en fait, qui ont des visages vraiment, euh, vraiment durs. Ensuite, euh, euh, la, la deuxième approche, en fait, c'est de les passer euh, en, en modélisation, en 3D pour le jeu. Et le but, c'est de ne pas perdre l'essence qu'on a dans la, dans la peinture, parce que c'était carrément de la peinture qu'on avait, c'était pas juste des croquis. Et, et garder ça en 3D, donc là, le, la contrainte, c'était plutôt technique, c'est comment garder quelque chose un peu de vivant et, euh, et, euh, et pas de tout générique, tout lisse. En fait, ce travail de stylisation qu'on a, qu a réalisé sur nos personnages, on a aussi voulu l'appliquer sur nos animaux. Ce pas des animaux qu'on a l'habitude de voir, ils sont vraiment particuliers. Et là, j'ai en tête l'exemple du Wolfhound, où justement, on a pris, on a pris un chien, mais on l'a mélangé aussi avec un peu, un peu de crocodile, un peu de girafe, pour, pour le rendre vraiment unique et qui a un côté fantastique dans notre univers. On a fait une silhouette très forte, il se déplace vraiment d'une manière très particulière. Ce n'est pas, pas un chien qu'on pourrait croiser dans la rue tous les jours. For Dishonored, we worked with uh, Blind Light, which is a great company out in LA, who not only helped us find uh, some really great actors to, to fill all the roles, but also we worked with a few key people that we picked out that you would call like celebrity talent. You know, the game is mostly an action game, but it's also got some role-playing game-based elements. For some of the characters, we, we you know, had a list of people we wanted to go after. Brad Dourif plays uh, our character, Piero, who's a, a craftsman, artificer, natural philosopher. Damn Sokolov! He will haunt me to my grave! Chloe Grace Moretz was uh, good enough to lend her voice to a character named Emily, who's quite important. 
I love getting in the in the booth and just kind of playing with the different voices and sounds and stuff you can make and, and trying to really get the acting through onto the video game. Susan Sarandon, I'm, a, I'm older, so I'm a big fan of hers from even far as far back as the Rocky Horror Picture Show days. And she plays a, an interesting character that I, I don't want to say too much about right now. So those guys bring their own ideas to what the character's feeling and uh, the intensity. And uh, so just talking purely in narrative terms, I think the, the voice actors add a level of polish and help the player just sort of like empathize with what's going on. I want the Dishonored world to leave a souvenir and a, and a memory in the player as if they had really been to this place and it moved them. And I hope it will stay in fiction as, a, as one of the places that will give people goosebumps and shivers.